walking with Bartram. Because temperatures were in the upper 90s and there's a large elevation gain to the top of Rape and Bald, the hike in July was canceled. We picked up again in August on the final Georgia section of the hike, Hell Ridge Road to Wilson Gap. I'm Watson Harlan. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and a cultural consultant and historian who works in and around the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. William Bartram entered into the Cherokee Nation on the cusp of the American Revolution. The area that he visited around Cowie Mound was sort of the central economic trade node of the Cherokee Nation because it existed in relative proximity to portages on the Atlantic coast and portages that would go into the Mississippi Valley and eventually the Gulf of Mexico. It's a major trade town and it's also near one of the older towns um, Nokwishini, which is the star mound that is in the center of modern-day Franklin, North Carolina. These mound towns and townhouses existed as means of trade and common meeting grounds for people within the Cherokee Nation and also acted as places that could host foreign delegations and delegations from other nations, among which Bartram was considered to be one. William Bartram is an interesting crossroads between those people as a botanist or a natural scientist first and an anthropologist second. He comes in with a few biases that are a direct result of his upbringing as a Westphalian Westerner. He inherently has to believe in the concept of nation state. He's not walking into it with the context that we have today. He may not know as much about contact with the Spanish. He may not know as much about the cross-pollination of species that's happened. He wouldn't have the genetic demarcators to know about our complex international trade. But what he does come into contact with is sort of a microcosm of the type of forestry that we practice and the type of agriculture that was practiced. I continued several miles, pursuing my serpentine path through and over the meadows and green fields, profusely productive of flowers and fragrant strawberries, their rich juice dyeing my horse's feet and ankles. William Bartram. I was just pointing this one out here. Oh, okay. The American chestnut became functionally extinct during the first four decades of the 20th century after an exotic fungus was introduced on Japanese chestnut nursery stock. What one biologist has called the greatest ecological catastrophe since the last ice age. The end result, the loss of an estimated 5 billion chestnut trees and 2 billion tons of biomass across more than 320 million acres of forest. In the 21st century, it is perhaps ironic that the Chinese chestnut provides one of the best hopes of returning the American chestnut to the eastern deciduous forest, as breeding programs that cross the two species have produced trees with significant levels of blight resistance. As the various restoration efforts move forward, none of them can be too prudent or vigilant. But who knows? Maybe trees just like this will again inhabit the eastern deciduous forests. Perhaps not in my lifetime, but maybe our children's lifetime or, or our grandchildren's lifetime. Hi, I'm Marina Buckner. Um, I've been foraging for about five or six years. I'm certified in about 22 different species of edible fungi and um, in seven states. If you are going to go mushroom hunting or foraging, it's extremely important to make sure that you have properly identified a species. So here we have enoki mushrooms, common name the black velvet slip. I do not recommend actively going and looking for velvet foot. Uh, chances are you're probably going to find gallerina or the species are a species of hypoloma, which you know are poisonous. Only experienced hunters should look for those species. Foraging, it's going out and becoming close with nature. It's also going and searching for not only food but yourself. You know, you sit down and you realize that these tiny species of fungi are really making this entire ecosystem work. They've inspired me to be more connected with my community and nature into making this all just a better place.
William Bartram gives us a sort of peek into the sunset of a period and the beginning of the next period of the Cherokee Nation. There are many ecological and forestry developments that are made by the Cherokee Nation that would not even be considered in United States forestry until well into the late 20th century and even into today, where many U.S. forest services are now contacting native states and trying to engage in ethnobotany to reestablish this sort of cultural diplomacy through ecology and development. The Cherokee Nation at its core, in its traditional values, hinges upon obligation to one another, obligation to the place that you live, the people that you're around, the family that have raised you, and to the greater society that you live in. And so your predominant obligation is to leave the place that you live in a better place than when you found it, be it through an ecological lens and preserving the environment that you live in, be it a societal lens where you build societal aid programs that help people that are less fortunate than you. It's a way of looking at life that is one that is inherently native and one that I hope to preserve. Join us next time for the sixth section of our hike, Hill Ridge Road to Jones Gap. This section brings us into North Carolina. Connect with us on YouTube and Facebook. If you enjoyed this, click the thumbs up and follow us to see the next episode.